I welcome you to the 110th lecture of the Sri Lankan Literary Society in UK. Today's meeting is with regards to the legacy of Arthur C. Clarke. And I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Karwan Patnikunga. Karwan is one of our members. Uh, I'm very glad that he is uh, he's a member of uh, the SLLS and he's a great friend of mine. In, uh, he has a PhD from Australian National University, uh, which he obtained in 1983. His 25-year career in astrophysical research continued at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, the USA, and ended at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Uh, Carvin's career highlights include the first in situ sample of field halo K giants in galactic halo, that it was in 80, 1983, and the first hot gravitational lens discovered with NASA Hubble Space Telescope in 1995. So he has loads of other things to say, but these are the two things we, uh, we would like to highlight as a, a career highlights. He retired back to Sri Lanka in 2005. Unlike many other people who had a chance to settle down in USA, he decided to come back to Sri Lanka and now he's there in Mount Lavinia. His current interests include increasing the information on Lanka on the internet via his domain, lakdiva.org, which you can visit and see for yourself what work he's doing. And archaeology, with a special interest in numismatics for people who don't know uh, what that means. It's about the coins. He has a huge collection of coins, um, very ancient coins up to the current uh, era, as well as notes. And then uh, this include including silver coins from the great master's shipwreck that Arthur C. Clarke himself was associated uh, with the discovery. So to listen uh, about Atsri Clark, I hand you over to Dr. Karvan Ratnatunga Karvan. The forum is yours. Thank you very much. I hope I'm unmuted. Ah, okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and I'm very happy that SLL has invited me to give this uh, lecture on Arthur Clark on his 15th death anniversary, which is uh, to, uh, today, 15th of no, uh, 19th of March. And I hope uh, to start the proceedings by having a minute silence, because I think in honor of him, he, he did a great service. We'll have a one minute silence. Thank you very much. And I request everybody to have their video muted to make sure that the reception is better. Okay. So I talked today about Arthur Clark. Okay. On Zoom. Okay, I, Arthur Clarke was born in 1917, December 16th in Minehead, Somerset, England, and was the eldest of four children. This is a photograph of Arthur Clarke when he was two years old. I thought I, I keep to Arthur Clarke's uh, 
uh, thing or doing magic. And I sort of colorize this with the AI tool called, uh, and I think it improves the resolution as well as makes black and white images into color, which is quite magic for me. And I think uh, to quote Arthur Clarke's third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I think that colorization and improving the resolution is one such thing, which I don't understand how it is done, even though I spent my time uh, discussing uh, doing uh, image processing with the Hubble. Here, color photograph, a black and white photograph I found. This is when it goes color. And what is more fascinating is when it improves the resolution of the photograph. I have no idea how it is done. It must be like chat GPT, which is now becoming very popular, but I think this is even more complicated. Okay, Arthur Clarke uh, in his early, uh, in 1943 was working for the Royal Air Force. And his most uh, famous suggestion was around that time when uh, he suggested the use of geostationary satellites for global communication. He wrote a letter in 1945, February issue of the Wireless World. And this, uh, from after the letter, scientific paper also was published in October of 1945, which is quite famous. And it became a reality just in 20 years. The equatorial orbit, which is 35,000 kilometers from the Earth, has been officially named the Clark Orbit by the International Astronomical Union. Now, this is uh, Arthur Clark reading my copy of the 1945 February Wireless World. In this, he writes an art letter to the editor about the peaceful use of the V2, uh, V2, V2 being the rocket that was developed by the Germans for bombing London, but after the war, they were all picked up and brought, taken away to G uh, in USA and Russia, which started a journey into space. This same article, uh, a more serious article over the letter was published in October, and this is the October 45 issue. And he still talks about extraterrestrial relays uh, to give worldwide uh, communication coverage, which is what we are using today to communicate instantly over uh, between us in England and Sri Lanka and anywhere else in the world. This happens when you have a uh, satellite orbiting the Earth and it is over the equator and takes exactly 24 hours to orbit the Earth. Then the satellite would be stationary with respect to the rotation of the Earth and with, uh, appear to us at the same location. So this is the sort of thing you have a satellite uh, at, at some uh, 35,000 kilometers away and it is stationary with respect to you. We have one on top of uh, this is a weather satellite, which is on top in the Clark orbit, looking down at the Indian Ocean and it will, this is the sort of view of the whole globe that it will see from out there. So each of these satellites have a view of most of the globe. And with about three satellites, you can have communication on all directions. So in his figure three of that paper, he showed how you could have three satellites located at a geosynchronous orbit and that would be able to communicate among itself and communicate with the whole world. This is what uh, the current situation with respect to weather satellites are. We have about five weather satellites monitoring the global weather and what you get as weather forecasts all come from these satellites. The first geosynchronous satellite was uh, launched in 1964, just 19 years after Arthur wrote that article. And it is, was used to relay uh, the Summer Olympics in 1964 from Tokyo to the US. It was near the international dateline. 
If you take the satellites that are in orbit, there are about 5,000 active satellites now in orbit around the Earth, of which about 500 are in geostationary orbit. This geostationary orbit is the orbit that you see located like here. And that is uh, the orbit that has more than 10% of the satellites uh, that are in current orbit. So it has become the most important of the orbits. Interestingly, if you look at one of these uh, satellites from the ground, you can actually point a telescope at it if you know the coordinates of the satellite. You see them stationary. If you, are, if you don't track with the telescope, you'll see the stars rising and setting, but you would see the three satellites uh, in this picture as geostationary stationary satellites which do not move with the rising and the setting of the stars. So Clark was interested in uh, interplanetary uh, uh, thing from early days. He was uh, as a teenager in 1934. He was uh, became a member of the British Interplanetary Society and was chairman from 46 to 47 and 51 to 53. From 41 to 46, he served in the Royal Air Force as a radar specialist involved in early warning radar scenes. And after the war in 1948, he got a first class degree in mathematics and physics from the King's College London. So he has the same physics background that I had. Uh, around that same time, he decided to uh, publish science fiction stories and his science fiction stories were published uh, <laughs> uh, science fiction stories were published uh, in 1946 and in 40, uh, 46 he got the first story ever sold in 1946 may published in may and a few others I was lucky to buy the copies of these uh, uh, stories. Uh, so he has uh, described all these articles and I will, uh, the first article was uh, that he published was in April of 1946. And he had um, an article called Maria in Astounding Science Fiction. Uh, he was not famous at that time. He didn't get the cover. The next article, which he says was the first that he got paid for was in May 1946. All these are old uh, um, pulp ma magazines called pulp magazines. I will show them if you are interested after the lecture. Uh, Guardian Angel was written in April of 1950 and was really became the groundwork of a story that uh, became his book, one of his most famous book called Childhood's End. And uh, that was, I think, in my opinion, his best piece and the one that made him famous, but he was still not on the cover of these pulp magazines. Uh, this is the book Childhood's End uh, by Arthur Clarke, the first edition paperback, not the hardcover. Uh, his first uh, novel, Prelude to Space, uh, 19, was published in 1951 and it gave a plan about how to execute a spaceship uh, uh, to trip, build and execute a spaceship to the moon. Really sort of giving a description of what the moon travel would be in a more realistic way than Jules Verne, I guess. And that after that, around that same time in 1951, <laughs> he wrote a more scientific book called The Exploration <clears throat> of Space by Werner von Braun. Uh, and, that, and Werner von Braun, uh, used that book, Exploration of Space, to um, uh, convince President John F. Kennedy that it was possible to go to the moon. So that uh, uh, thing was a sort of very interesting uh, uh, mm -hmm. thing to know that his book was, his, that his thing was uh, used to Okay, 
the next article, next short story that I will talk about is the senator. And that is famous basically because it was the one that led him to write in the book uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Each of these short stories he uh, later on produced to uh, make a longer story. And in this case, it was the origin of the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, that is by far his most famous book because it became one of Stanley Kubrick's big movies and it still stands out and the American Film Institute claims that this is the 15th uh, film uh, institute, the 15th world, uh, in the top 100 greatest movies, it, they list it as the 15th in 2008. Yeah. Arthur was very a stickler for uh, for actually space uh, things and stickler to make sure that the science in it, all these movies as well as his books was exactly within the framework of science. He, uh, uh, he paid, um, he was very worried and I can remember him and discussing this with him that the scene of uh, David Bowman going through the vacuum to re-enter the spaceship discovery uh, after hell, the computer refused to let him in. Uh, he knew that if somebody goes into vacuum, that that person's blood would boil. But he got medical opinion that that uh, will happen only after about 15 seconds, 15 to 30 seconds, because there had been experiments done to uh, do that with uh, various uh, uh, um, dog, uh, animals as well as uh, I think I'm not sure I don't think it was done with humans and in vacuum and that was about 15 seconds then I think it lasted 14 seconds in the movie this is a view of pre picture of Arthur C. Clarke in 1968 uh, on the time on the making of the movie. Uh, it was only in 1953 that Arthur Clarke became famous enough to uh, get the covers of the store, uh, his, of the pulp magazines. And these are two pulp magazines where he is played in the cover. There are quite a few more. His most famous uh, uh, book is Rendezvous with Ranma, mm -hmm. which uh, he published in 1973. It won all the major awards, mm -hmm. the Hugo Award the, for, and the Nebula Award. Mm -hmm. And this created a big you know, database mm -hmm. of fans. And uh, the movie uh, with Morgan Freeman uh, was produced, uh, so was supposed to be produced and released in 2009. Mm -hmm has not been so far been released and sadly in development uh, only. Uh, Clark's uh, books have been translated to uh, many languages, about 40 languages, I'm told by looking at the internet. And um, one of uh, one of Mr. Bandusila, who is in the audience today, translated them about 10 or 15 of his books into Sinhala. And I'm, I understand they have also been translated to Tamil. So this is one of Bandusila's books in Sinhala. Arthur Clarke's, one of his books, which is quite famous, is called uh, uh, Profiles of Paradise, uh, uh, Fountains of Paradise, and set in Sri Lanka. He wrote this book in 1976. And the concept that he has proposed there uh, to go to space uh, using an elevator is being seriously con considered and supported by Sri Ram breakthroughs in nanotechnology. Let me talk a bit about that. The basic idea is that you have a very strong cable on the equator stretching up to the Clark orbit. Uh, then this so that you have a counterweight, you had a counterweight beyond the Clark orbit so that the 
uh, mass uh, center of mass of the system is on the ge uh, geosynchronous orbit. And uh, this thing has to have a very strong cable. Uh, this is sort of artist conception of it. You will have uh, about a 13 ton uh, elevator, which will go with a capacity of about 20 tons to take things into or orbit. The operating costs are estimated to be about $250 uh, per kilogram, which is a lot less than the $10,000 per kilogram that it currently costs to put a, 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 a thing into orbit. So this way, if this is, becomes reality, and there is a Japanese firm which is saying that they could do this by 2050, I'm not sure whether that will, is a realistic estimate, but people are seriously considering this and trying to do it uh, from uh, to make it a reality. Um, the climbers will take about eight days to climb up to geosynchronous orbit. And there is a lot of stuff about this and they have had conferences about this uh, many times. And the base will not be in Sri Lanka. I mean, for many reasons. Uh, one is that it has to be exactly on the equator and we are not on the equator. And the other thing is that it needs to be a region which does not have much lightning. And the area that has been selected for it is about 1,500 kilometers from the Galapagos Islands, which according to this chart has the least amount of uh, uh, lightning strikes uh, and a mobile platform will also allow it to avoid some of these lightning strikes. So, so this is, I will quote Clark's second law, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little past them into the impossible. So maybe I'm not sure whether this uh, uh, elevator will be possible, but without trying, we'll never know. And that's what he said, uh, the Clark's second law was. Arthur Clark was in 1986, named the Grand Master of Science Fiction and would clearly be remembered on the way not Jules Verne and H.G. Wells as one of the greatest science fiction writers. Arthur Clark and Ceylon, uh, his uh, association with Ceylon, he arrived in 1954 uh, on his way to Australia to do uh, diving in the Great Barrier Reef. After returning to Ceylon in 1956, February, he wrote to a good friend that he liked the people, the climate and the cost of living. Maybe now he won't say much about the cost of living. Uh, he wrote even a year on the Great Barrier Reef did not unlock the doors of memory. Not until I came to Ceylon did I fall in love with an exquisite arc of beach on the island's south coast and decided to establish a home there. This place is Gaul and near Gaul, Unavatna near Gaul on the southern coast of Ceylon. This is a picture of the Unavatna before all the hotels took over and now it's not as nice and clean as what Arthur could remember it as when he went there. Uh, he also wrote the drab chill northern beach on which I had so often shivered through an English summer was merely a pale reflection of an ultimate and long unsuspected beauty. Like the three princes of Serendip, I had found more than I was seeking in Serendip itself. 10,000 kilometers from the place I was born, I had come home. Uh, he says also, and away from the slender palm trees leaning over the white sands, the warm sun sparkling on the waves as they break on the inshore reef. This, the outrigger fishing boats drawn up high on the beach. This alone is real. The rest is but a dream from which I will shall presently wake. That was what Arthur Clark wrote in 1964 on Sri Lanka. He, one of the first things he did in 1959, he started the Ceylon Astronomical Association. He was the founding president of it. And during the 60s, he used to travel the world and bring back the latest news with pictures of space exploration, which is shared at our monthly meetings held at the USIS. The Lincoln Auditorium used to have our monthly meetings of the Astronomical Society. That is when I first met him. 
And he clearly inspired the careers of some of us who became interested in astronomy and space. I can mention at least four or five who were inspired by Arthur Clarke to become astronomers. This is a photograph of him uh, in 1968. The previous one was with his Cuesta on the Inuatuna beach. This one, the Cuesta is sitting on the side and he has the first Ceylon's desk computer, which was in 1968 and HP 9100A, which I think was gifted to him by HP. Computer. It's now currently on display at the Arthur C. Clarke Institute. This is him with his 14 inch uh, Celestron telescope. I met him officially uh, in June of 1969 when there was a radio show. We didn't have television at the time. And he took questions from, I was in school and he took questions from us uh, in school at a Radio Ceylon uh, program of which this picture appeared in the newspapers. Apollo 11 was the next month in uh, July of 1969. And Arthur Clarke was the CBS commentator what Walter Conkright for all the NASA Apollo missions. And that really put him on the spotlight because those missions were watched by the whole world. Unfortunately, we in Sri Lanka couldn't watch them alive and had to wait till Clarke came back with the stories as well as uh, the video which was brought in by the USIS. We have a photograph of Arthur Clarke with Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk in space. In the, sorry, walk in the, on the moon. Arthur had a great sense of humor. One interesting story, which I can remember, was that the Flat Earth Society, worried that they would be unable to explain the view of the Earth as a globe, published a fantasy story in the TWA magazine saying that the moon landing was staged by a NASA, by NASA, with the Arthur Clarke writing the screenplay. I can still remember reading this magazine. And uh, Arthur was very amused that he was named as the author. Uh, 20 years later, that same fantasy was made into a conspiracy theory by a famous TV program. So that was in the 90s and observing the new interest Arthur said that he had sarcastically written to his good friend Dan Goldin, who was then the NASA administrator, and reminded him that he had never been paid royalties for the Hawk moon landing screenplay. He told me that NASA never replied his email. Clark was brought to uh, Ceylon uh, for interest in diving. And uh, he, with Mike Wilson, uh, was diving right around Sri Lanka. And this is a book he wrote about the reefs of Taprobain uh, with photographs from Mike Wilson, an underwater adventure around Ceylon. And while he was in this in 1961, he discovered a treasure of the Great Bassas Reef. Uh, he was also at that time, they were preparing to make a movie uh, which some of you may have seen, it was called Ranmutudua. Ranmutudua was the first full length single language film which was in color. And it was directed by Mike Wilson and co produced by Arthur Clark. It starred Garmini Fonseca, Joey Berrickham, and Jivari Kulakura Surya. And this film, I'm sure many of you have seen, had a lot of underwater scenes which were, they were filming. And while they were preparing for that film, uh, Mike Wilson discovered treasure of the Great Brasses Reef. Arthur was writing about a book about treasure and then this was discovered. Uh, these were, then the, they didn't recover the treasure till 1963. And these were the coin lumps that were recovered from the Great Brasses Reef in 19. So the Great Brasses, uh, Basel's Reef is off uh, Kirinda, or sort of on the side of Yala, which is more famous. And uh, it um, is visible, uh, it's out here, if you, can, if you can see my arrow, it's out here. 
off the coast. There is a lighthouse there. And this is a sort of a drawing of the shipwreck that was discovered. We can see various things, an anchor uh, um, on the bottom, various areas where coins were found. And these coins, which were all minted in Surat uh, in India, all of the year 111, 1113 Islamic year age, which term translates to 1702. Uh, and it had this uh, na uh, nature. And uh, you get lots of lumps, so most of them in the center of the lump being quite in min state. And this is a complete lump, which is currently uh, in the Smithsonian, I managed to see it in the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. It's not on display, it was dis on display at an exhibition. Uh, this was the book that Arthur wrote with Ma about the discovery uh, Indian Ocean treasure around that time, in addition to his bigger book. This is a lump of uh, silver rupees, one of the tiny part of uh, one of those lumps. This must, the big lumps had about 1,000 coins. This one must be having about 25 coins and a few other broke a few, uh, coins from the reef, which I managed to acquire. I will show that thing. Arthur went diving again for his last time in 1992 when he was 75 years old. And this is a picture of his last dive. Arthur also starred in a film, Bad De Gama, in 1980. It's Leonard Wu's The Village in a Jungle. And it starred him as a minor role as the English judge and had Malini Fonseca, Joe Abbey and Vijay Kumar Tunga, the former husband of uh, Chandrika Kumar Tunga. Uh, he also had a series of TV uh, things called Mr. Uh, Arthur Clarke's Mysterious World, Arthur Clarke's World of Strange Powers, and Arthur Clarke's Mysterious Universe, all made by the Yorkshire Television and uh, showed on TV. Uh, some of these, I think, were shown in Sri Lanka. I was abroad at that time. And there are 52 episodes in all. I'm not sure whether it's available. I have not watched them all. And that is his TV, so if you, you can actually show a whole year worth. Uh, Clark was made uh, the Clark, what he calls the Clark Act, we has allowed him as a distinguished guest to live in Sri Lanka for the full year without paying tax on his foreign income. Uh, till then, till 1976, Arthur used to live six months abroad and six months in Sri Lanka because of the reasons of tax. And this act allowed him to continue to live in Sri Lanka permanently without going abroad. And that was a great, he spent more of his time in Sri Lanka after that uh, permission. In 2005, the government presented with the Lanka Abhimania, the pride of Lanka, which is Sri Lanka's highest civilian honor. Uh, he, Arthur Clark was not, uh, not only made his home, Sri Lanka, uh, Cham, he adopted his lifestyle. For those of us who had an opportunity of meeting him regularly, he was a friend whom you could drop in without any appointment and discuss life, the universe, and everything. That is sort of very nice to the fact that he uh, did not require, I mean, now we, even, we don't even visit relations without calling and finding out uh, if uh, they are in and whether they are willing to we can visit, but those days when we were small, I can remember you didn't visit, when we visited visit, uh, relations, you never called ahead because that was considered in Sri Lankan culture to be an insult, why you wouldn't come if I was not here. So another thing I can remember from that day is uh, something which I've been spending a lot of my mornings these, for the last couple of days, which is to see sunrise behind Siripada. The first time I saw it was in 1976 from a rooftop from my home in Kulupitiya. 
and I wanted to photograph it. I didn't have a telephoto tele, a, a telephoto lens to fit onto SLR. So I borrowed, I went to Arthur and said, can I borrow his uh, a telephoto lens? He was quite uh, obliging. He gave and uh, lent it to me, that expensive lens. I took it back and tried to, I think two or three times I tried to uh, photograph with it, but each of the times I had this camera with me, the clouds would not oblige and it was cloudy. So I gave up finally. And the last time before leaving Sri Lanka in 78, I said, I will go up to the roof just to see. And it was the day that it was perfectly clear and I saw a glorious sight and, but no camera. I had to wait till 2007 to get my images shown here. Arthur Clark was also went in national dress. I can remember being embarrassed when I was in Western attire. And when he arrived at my wedding in national dress, uh, in a smart national dress, I was really embarrassed to be in Western attire. I remember him commenting about the modern watches on those hands with, in full candy and regalia. So I have sort of adopted it. I have never worn suit or tie since 1982. And I'm one was it by inspired by Arthur Clark that you don't need to wear suit and tie. This is a picture of him. Uh, he had a lot of pets. One of his uh, the picture of him on is one of his old typewriters, electric typewriter. And his baby monkey Silky is on his arm. Here another case when he has a Chinua and it has Shuhawa and he has a, what was the last Pepsi, his last of his canine friends. He has even buried them in his, uh, in his uh, graves for them in 25 Barnes Place. There are graves for each of his pets. Okay, Clark was also the first chancellor of the International Space University from 1989 to 2004. And 1996, the International Astronomical Union named asteroid number 4923 in his honor. They wanted to give him 2001, but that had been already been assigned to Albert Einstein. So Clark didn't get 2001. Uh, this was a st two stamps that we issued by Sri Lanka in 1999 for a conference for 50 years of communication that was held in 1999. And his, he was he appeared on that those two stamps, and this is an autograph for Stekawa. He was given a uh, Knight Bachelor in 2000 March 15th by former Prince of Wales who came to uh, uh, Charles who came to Sri Lanka to give it to him, and now King Charles. This is uh, Clark with his. Uh, T Rex in his garden. And in nine, 2003, scientists at the Aust University of Monash, Australia, named the newly discovered dinosaur species Serentisarsus Arthur C. Clarke. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. This is his visiting card where he uh, had written his. Uh, email address, his email address was only known to his close friends. And he never, that was one of the top secrets that he wouldn't let any of us who knew it, share it online with anybody. He used to autograph books for his fans. This is a book plate autographed by Arthur Clark. And his rare first editions of Childhood's End have sold for over $4,000. That was a long time ago. It must be a lot more expensive now. And he was once commented that autographs, so he has autographed so many of these rare copies that unautographed copies may be more valuable. <laughs> he had a good sense of humor. In 2000, the, when I was in Carnegie Mellon, they wanted me to interview him for a program called Earthware. And a good world in 2050, will computers help or hinder? That uh, interview is posted on YouTube if you all are interested. I can provide the link. In 2003, HAL 9000 
was uh, inducted into the Robot Hall of Fame of the Carnegie Mellon University. And at this function, I can remember he, uh, he, he's, that was the view of Hal Newthausen and he, com he compare, comments, although I've never considered 2001 as a strict, strict prediction, but as more as a vision, a way things could work. I have long kept track of informally of how our vision compares with computer science reality. Some things we got right, even righter than we ever had reason to suspect others well who could have known. So that's what he presented there. At that event, two other robots were inducted into the Hall of Fame. And these are pictures of them. Uh, I was at that function and I took this photograph and I will give this as a task for everybody to predict who those two uh, robots who were even famous. There are two famous robots, not in their costume as they appeared in the film, but uh, they are two famous name recognition robots. Uh, this is a photograph of Clark in 2005 March when I, when after the tsunami of 2004 December, for the first time he traveled down to his place in Hikadua. I come and accompanied him down there and interviewed him. And I can still remember, still remember on that trip, him going to Novatuna and seeing it in its destroyed state, refused to even get down from his car. In 2007, December 16th, his 90th birthday was celebrated uh, at his home in Barnes Place. And a few of us who knew him well were there for his 90th birthday. And uh, he was uh, uh, given a much grander celebration by, by the foreign ministry uh, requested by uh, President Mahindra Rajapaksa at the time. And that was held in the Central Bank Auditorium. And they had invited Alexei Leonov, the first man to walk in space, to attend this meeting along with his close friends. Unfortunately, this was to be his last. That's a photograph of Arthur Clark at that event uh, with the huge cake that was there. This is Arthur Clark with Alexei Leonov and Mahindra Rajapaksa. I was able to have an exhibition of my collection of Arthur C. Clarke memorabilia at his uh, official birthday party at the Central Bank. His three wishes for his 90th birthday was to see evidence of extraterrestrial life, which we still have not seen, and uh, that we kick the uh, addiction to oil and to see lasting peace established in Sri Lanka. That fortunately happened about two years after his passing. I will end this talk uh, with a few quotations uh, from Arthur Clarke on religion. And one of, uh, on Arthur Clarke on religion says, one of the greatest tragedies of mankind is that morality has been hijacked by religion. On religion, he says, the most malevolent and persistent of all mind righteousness we should get rid of it as quick as we can. On Clark was, is quoted to have said in a book, Childhood Zen, that the only form of purified Buddhism, the most astute of uh, religion still survived. This was a quotation from his book, Childhood Zen, which he wrote before he actually, in 1953, before he settled down in Sri Lanka. And in 2005, this was misquoted in the Singhala about there, which mentions Buddha Agama. Uh, and he was quick to point out that he was talking about the philosophy, Dhamma, and not the faith-based religion practiced by a majority in Lanka. On nationalism, he said, it is not easy to see how the more and extreme forms of nationalism can long survive when men have seen the earth as a true perspective, as a single small globe against the stars. There is a hopeful symbolism in the fact that flags do not wave in the vacuum. So 
we have not come back to it. We are still warring between nations at the moment. On climate change, he said, climate change has now added a sense of urgency. I would like to see us kick the current addiction to oil and adopt clean and renewable energy sources. Our civilization depends on energy, but we can't allow oil and coal to slowly bake our planet. Uh, his view of the future, which he had published many times in his uh, uh, science fiction books and science things, uh, stories featured the extrapolation of technological innovation and scientific breakthroughs. An optimistic view of science empowering mankind's exploration of the solar system and the world's oceans. Imag images an Ethiopian setting with highly developed technology, ecology, and society. I hope it happens because we don't seem to be trending in that direction at the moment. So uh, Clark's first law I will show, he, he said, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. There's been many case, such cases, and so I think he has been right. Arthur Clarke passed away at 1.30 a.m. Sri Lankan time on 2008, March 19th in Colombo. This is him lying in state at his home residence. Father Mervin Fernando there. He was also a president of the Astronomical Society at one time and a good friend of Arthur C. Clarke's. I remembered when I saw that uh, scene there that it reminded me of the scene of David Bowman in Arthur Clarke's film 2001, in the last scene, one of the last scenes when he says he fumbled for the light switch in the room that was plunged into darkness and within seconds he passed beyond the reach of Bowman, uh, of uh, dreams. Arthur was very uh, uh, completely secular and uh, did not see the need for religion. He had left instructions that absolutely no religious rites of any kind relating to any religion, faith should be associated with my funeral. And no intervention from the government of Sri Lanka or the United Kingdom. It was held on Saturday, um, March 22nd, three days later, General Cemetery Karantha. It was attended by his brother, Fred, and sister Mary, and three nieces. I spoke to the nieces. Unfortunately, some of them had not been to Sri Lanka during his lifetime. And he was there to rest next to Leslie Ekanayaka, who died in a motorcycle accident in 1977, July 4th. This is the funeral cottage. And this is his brother, Fred, and sister. So this uh, is the tombstone. Here is uh, Arthur Charles Clark. He never grew up, but he never stopped growing. And uh, I think that is what all of us who are growing old should do, to never grow up. And in honor of him, I sort of wore this T-shirt. It says, no growing up. I wore it last time when I gave a lecture in 16th of December 2017 on its 100th anniversary. And it sort of reminds me of an incident that I remember in the early days of 1970 when I visited him and his mother Nora was visiting him from England. Arthur asked if I had seen his latest toy and went into his office to bring it out. I was left chatting with his mother who said, little things please little minds. Arthur was still her kid, refusing to grow up. Soon after, he returned with a plastic frame enclosing sand which did not mix completely and created stations like on the rock face. I'm sure you have seen that sort of thing now, which is a popular tourist item. Uh, let's say a few more things about Clark, uh, the Arthur C. Clark Center and the Moratua University. From 1979 to 2002, he held the post of Chancellor of the new University of Moratua from its in inception to uh, 2002. In 1982, 
He won the Marconi International Fellowship Award, and he used the money of that award to build the Arthur C. Clarke Institute for Modern Technologies in Muratwa. He unfortunately dissociated with himself with that institution after a about 10 years because it was not going in the direction that he wished it to see. I can remember him asking me in 1994 whether I was interested in becoming the director and I said no because I was doing research with the Hubble at the time. Uh, he, all his manuscripts have been taken to uh, England and it was in a, the, what he calls the Clark Archives uh, in Totten, Somerset, England. And after Fred passed away, all the Clark papers were donated to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington and can be viewed there. Uh, Arthur C. Clark Foundation was started in 1983 to, the, to further wisdom and values of Sir Arthur Clark. And the foundation's mission is to promote and enable the, and recognize the power of imagination to benefit humanity. You can see details of it at clarkfoundation.org. There is the Arthur C. Clark Trust, which was founded in 2001 to support and sustain Clark's passion for diving through his two companies, Underwater Safaris and Scuba Safaris. The dive shop that is set up back in the 1960s still continues to operate from Trincomalee. His last will designated this private trust that is registered in Sri Lanka as the sole legal custodian of his literary estate. And that uh, trust has a website called arthurclark.org. Arthurclark.org. Many persons worldwide were influenced deeply by his books and writings. Most had never met him since he lived in a far distant exotic land called Sri Lanka. He was by far the most famous foreigner that made Sri Lanka known to the world. Sir Arthur C. Clarke made Sri Lanka his home for 50 of his 90 years. I, privilege, I feel privileged that I met him regularly over 40 of those years. Arthur will remain etched in the memory of the, all those who need for unfortunate to know him personally through his books, his enormous contributions to humanity be clearly be cherished forever. That's a photograph of Arthur Clark when he was 90. This is a picture of Arthur Clark uh, on at his desk in before he passed away in 19, 2007, so I think shortly before. And this is a photograph of the same desk I when I visited Arthur Clark's home in two, last year in December. And I was very happy to see it practically in the same state. His pesta also still there and it's briefcased on the table. I think this is an ideal location to create a small museum for his work. So Sir Arthur Clark uh, was born and died in Colombo. Thank you. That is my lecture. I think